So obviously starting with good old fashioned uh, plane films. And I think, you know, in this era, we have a tendency to dismiss plane film radiography as, you know, maybe being old hat and maybe not giving us all that much information, but it actually is extremely useful. Firstly, because it's widely available, cheap, easy, uh, low risk, um, and can depict very serious pathology. Certainly you can see fractures, certainly you can see um, any lesions that may be infiltrating bone. Um, obviously we don't see the soft tissue very well. Um, it is a composite it, it is a composite image. In other words, you're taking a large volume of tissue and you're forming a single image out of that uh, out of that sing, out of that large data set. So so because because of that, there's superimposition of structures which often can make, seeing things quite diff difficult because you have overlying, overlying bowel, for example. Um, the other thing, and I haven't mentioned this on the slide, but, but we can also perform dynamic maneuvers using radiography. We can perform those with CT as well, for example, but, but that incurs a much higher radiation cost. Um, and those um, dynamic maneuvers often contribute significantly to uh, your evaluation um, in the spine context, uh, for example, for instability um, in addition, uh, particularly using whole spine radiography, uh, there's several biomechanical features that can be assessed looking at uh, various um, angles and orientations, um, which obviously is an entire discussion uh, in and of itself. But as spinal surgeons, you'll learn all about that in residency, the various, um, the various uh, angles and contours that, 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 you, that you may need to consider before uh, performing particularly a deformity surgery. And that, and that predominantly uh, relies on uh, plain film radiography or, or some variant of, of plain film radiography. Um, so CT, obviously, you start off with a plain film and you now, get, you now are able to not get a single superimposed image. You have, um, you have a tomographic representation across a single plane with multiple slices. And... This is a high spatial resolution. Spatial resolution is a term we use in radiology to say that you're able to depict very small structures. Um, and you're able to see uh, bone particularly well, particularly cortical bone. Soft tissue, not as well, but certainly better than you would see on a, on a, on a plain film. Um, and again, you know, the, the good thing about CT is again, widely available. Most of you will have a CT scanner available um, if not in your emergency room, immediately, mail, uh, immediately adjacent to the emergency room. Similarly, if not in the OR, immediately adjacent to the OR, probably. Um, and, and so this is very, you know, very accessible, very quick, has, has very few limitations as compared to, for example, MRI. Um, and, uh, and, you know, limitations, it's not, it's, it's not as good as MRI as, we, as, we'll, as we'll see in terms of soft tissue resolution. Um, and, um, in terms of the spine, it's, it's, it's not as good for, uh, for, for, for marrow as opposed to, as opposed to cortical bone. So, so in terms of evaluating marrow pathology, um, or marrow infiltration or marrow edema, you know, M MRI really is the way to go. Now, bear in mind what I'm, what I'm talking about here is, 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 uh, sort of your standard run of the mill CT and your standard run of run of the mill MRI. Um, you know, if you follow the, the literature closely, or if you work in a department where they're using very high-end uh, scanners or high-end uh, technology, you know, some, some of the things I'm saying may not be entirely accurate because of the advances in technology. But, but broadly speaking, what I'm, for the purposes of this talk, I'm talking about the sort of technology that's, that's pretty much available to everyone. Um, so again, CT, uh, again, depicting a cortical bone very well. You have some um, assessment, as you can see here, of the trabecular architecture of the bone. Um, for example, here you can see there's this infiltrative uh, lesion. And just for orientation, you guys probably know you have your vertebral bodies, you have your pedicles, you have your posterior elements, um, including your lamina and you know the pars articularis uh, going down here, depending on the orientation of the of the CT. Um, what I wanted to show you here is that we can also take the data from the CT and actually use it for some very uh, useful applications. We can do uh, what's known as finite element modeling. Uh, you guys may be um, aware of, which, which allows us to, for example, compare uh, 
population data with an individual's data and look at things like um, stress strain relationships across end plates. Um, and, uh, and, and there are various uh, software algorithms that are, that are becoming more and more available in terms of um, assisting your ability to, to, to decide uh, various characteristics of uh, pathology. So, so for example, to, to make an assessment of, um, of uh, whether a, a, uh, a, a, a vertebra with a, with a vertebral um, lesion, including a metastasis, is, is a stable or an unstable lesion. Uh, how, how, would, how would you guys typically, typically make that assessment now, do you think? Do you have any, do you have any sense of, of, how that's, of how that's done? Determining instability in the context of a spine metastasis or a spine neoplasm? That with the uh, SIN score? Exactly. Exactly, the SIN score, which is very, which is very helpful. Um, but in, a, in addition, we can, we can use uh, some of the software to, to, um, you know, to contribute to, to our decision making uh, in, 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 terms of, in terms of whether we think that a, a particular fracture is, is likely to occur if it hasn't already, um, or whether you're likely to um, have additional kyphosis going forward and so on. Um, and that's typically done using CT data um, and proprietary software. MRI, um, again, uh, the, the strengths are mostly around its uh, ability to, to um, differentiate different types of contrast. Uh, we have different types of sequences. Um, again, I think you guys will be aware. Uh, you may have seen the terms T1, T2, stir, flare, et cetera. Um, and, and what these relate to are the specific parameters that have been applied in the course of acquiring the MRI. We use uh, what are called radio frequency pulses, which um, measure, which measure uh, energy um, at times of relaxation um, of uh, proton spin. And, uh, you, and you know, without going into the physics too much, um, in terms of making these measurements, we know that different types of of tissues have different uh, measurements relative to one another. So looking at these individual measurements and forming a map of those measurements of the tissues relative to one another, we can, we can decipher different tissues from one another. Um, uh, I said uh, in terms of weaknesses, cost is you know, potentially an issue. Um, you know, in, again, in this modern era of, of trying to, trying to uh, keep healthcare costs uh, at a minimum, ideally. Um, MRI is becoming more and more um, ubiquitous and, and more and more available. Um, that being said, even, even if you do have several MRIs in your hospital, what, what you probably experience, uh, depending on where you work, is that there are significant wait times. Uh, to obtain an MRI. I mean, you can ob obtain a CT scan in under a minute, whereas, uh, whereas an MRI um, with, with uh, multiple sequences will, will, will take you traditionally, again, at least uh, 20 minutes um, and, and typically a lot longer than that because of the various uh, requirements and evaluations that are needed to be made prior to performing the MRI. So it becomes a, it becomes a, a, a logistic um, and scheduling issue um, more than anything in, in the context of a, of a hospital practice. And, and it's important to bear that in mind. So, you know, oftentimes, you know, the, the nasty radiologist will kind of call you up and say, hey, do you really need an MRI for this? You know, could we not just do a CT or, you know, can you, you know, can you not get by? Um, <laughs> you know, which is probably not, not something that you want to hear, but, but that, that's, that's the explanation. That, that may change over the over the next few years um, with some of the new technologies that we have if you're interested um, you can you can look at uh, things like compressed sensing which is uh, technology from the IT world um, also called uh, sparse um, sparse uh, data set evaluation um, and and that that really allows us to accelerate the amount of uh, uh, the amount of or, or reduce the amount of time that we need to acquire a, a, a data of of MRI, um, but again, just a traditional MRI uh, T1. Uh, you've probably heard of. Um, we 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 pretty much use this uh, uh, because of its ability to show us fat. Hey 
everyone, Ryan Rad here from NeurosurgeryTraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.